This video's topic has been requested a couple times over the years, including twice for the last video upload, so because my nervous system decided to choose violence last week and just make it a miserable week where I got all done, it's time for the bookshelf tour. <laughs> This video and other more serious videos are made possible thanks to the continuing support of viewers, patrons, and PayPal pals like you! You lovely people who are supporting this channel and me, especially right now where things just... Ugh. I really do want to say thank you to every patron and PayPal pal and everybody who's throwing money at me right now because this health situation is hard, it's scary, and you know, I'm trying to focus on this stuff because it is something motivating for me to do and keep my mind busy on things and my body doesn't always let me do that so um thank you I, I did not mean to start the video like this fuck uh to pivot topics a little bit uh and to calm down uh this is a sneak peek of stuff that's coming in the near future um because you know what better time of year to release a thicker more beefy sweater for people to use than the summer. Granted, I live in Northern California and the nights can get pretty cold, but like fourth wall, the timing could have been better, but we'll, we'll get into that when I get over there. So yeah. Hi, welcome back to the channel. And as mentioned, we are going to do a bookshelf tour. Uh, this side is going to be pretty easy. That side is going to be far more extensive. Uh, if you, I'm going to do it in chunks. So if you want to like skip and don't care about certain topics of books, uh, the chapter navigation should be an easy guide or easy way to do that. Also apologies that I can't get a cat to occupy that cube. Um, I guess it's the right time of night for them to just be doing cat business instead of being cute in there like it's their job to pay rent. Guys. Also apologies, I'm not sure how well it's going to pick up on this, especially doing this closer this way. My neighbors decided that 11 p.m perfect time to start vacuuming. So hopefully the noise filter will knock that out of the everything, but if it's if it's still there, I'm sorry. Okay, and since we can't have a kitty cat, we can have a chaos dragon. I'm gonna get a very, very furry butt. And that's why, that's why we're going rogue with the microphone. So I can, I can talk. I can still talk to you guys and be facing away from the camera. Huh? Master filmmaker, where's my awards? Okay, enough, enough blah, blah. Let's get to the book tour. Speaking of awards, I guess we could start there. This is the closest thing I could quite possibly ever get to a play button from YouTube because I'm just too niche for my own good. I want that stupid silver play button, but I keep releasing videos like the tar one, which is just so niche that just... Anyway, so yeah, friends gave me this for my birthday last year and i deeply appreciate it and also eh, yeah i i love love every single part of it especially the uh transparent background on the play button so that is chef's kiss perfect touch new lobster toy you know my chaos dragon actually got this in 2000 2001 somewhere in there so he's, he's an old boy He's, he's, he's done good. And we got a Pikachu Squishmallow, which I bought as a company purchase because he is part of my set. And you can do that. He is used very much in my set. <laughs> he's a good boy. So, of course, we have the Lobster Daddy books. Couldn't not have them. A notebook, which you can buy, although I might be getting rid of it because... They want way too much for this thing for what it is. I'm going to be honest. Like, it's an okay notebook and yay, it's got my stuff on it, but I've got it. So I make like a dollar on it. <laughs> they want way too much for it. Anyway, and then we got our T-Rex and like a chibi T-Rex. Or, yeah, are you a dinosaur? Whatever, they're cute. Because your girl was a dinosaur kid to the point where like, I don't know if it'll show up. This is a dinosaur t-shirt from Target. It's so sheer. Once a dinosaur girl, always a dinosaur girl, I guess. Okay, so this is a tarot deck I bought in high school. Seen some use, cause you know, sometimes you throw some cards like 
just do I want Taco Bell tonight? Cards say no. And then you go, hmm, hmm. No, I really want Taco Bell and just get it anyways. Although I haven't had Taco Bell in a while because it makes me sick at this point because, oh my God, I'm getting old. Anyway, I know we have some tarot people here. So this is the focus. There we go. Sacred Rose Tarot Deck. Um, that's like what the fool looks like on it. The flowers are the big theme and the color of the flowers and all that stuff. And I had a like air freshener sort of thing from Bath and Body Works tip over at one point on the bookshelf for the thing that this was in and it still kind of smells like that so that's nice. And then we got the classic design tarot deck that I bought for Beyond Order because the fool is the blah 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 at the blah 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 and you know Peterson went on and on about that and I thought it was going to be more of a recurring theme in this book than it was. Silly me. Oh I should get a Harry Potter deck. That'd be funny. Although JK would probably get the money for that. Then this was just a impulse buy at Walgreens while waiting for a prescription because it looked cool. Uh, major letdown. Major letdown. So the cards aren't that cool. I, think I thought it'd be more like, ooh, mystic and tarot y and ooh. Okay, I guess the Joker is kind of a vibe. So that's the back. Queen. Sort of has a death thing going on. Get my face out of frame. But then, like, hello. I'm just a boring regular card. Okay. So continuing to scoot over. Hopefully not over a cat. Yep. Yep. Let's see if I can record this. Oh, this. This is where Max is. You will note I started rolling. So his foot is kind of, kind of under the wheel there. Yeah. I mean, I guess it means he trusts us that he just continues to do shit like this, but like, boy, that's how you get squished feet. I'm gonna set up a cat cam down there, apparently. Bro. Bro, what do you have to say for yourself? Move your feet. Move your feet. Yeah, I'm trying to shame you. Move. Bro, here comes Izzy. There he is. Can I move the chair now? God, now Izzy's starting. What are you doing? What's going on, Gary? Move your tail. We're moving. Yeah, you're annoyed. Move your tail. Thank you. Uh, maybe I should just move the camera. That'd probably be smart. Now they're interested in the cube, of course. All right, I am scooched over. There might be cat noises in the background. We're just going to roll with it. But with the way I have this set up, I think it probably makes the most sense to work from the front and then to the side. Uh, so yeah, merch. We merch. I'm probably going to do some spring cleaning for the stuff that just people aren't buying uh, because YouTube finally integrated with Fourth Wall, who does the merch, and yay! So it can show up in the shelf and stuff, but there's like some stupid way that it's integrated where it shows and pulls every single color variant of shirts as separate things, and there's enough things that I can't see all of my stuff on the YouTube part of things, so some stuff's gonna get cold. Uh, including like the koozies. Those are probably going to go away. The beanies. Some of the citation needed stuff that just nobody's bought except maybe like one person. So like the workout shirts. So if you are interested in getting like koozies or other things, I would recommend doing it in the next like two weeks because then, then they're going to go bye-bye. Stickers. Definitely keeping the stickers. Awesome sticker. Not my sticker. Stickers we're going to keep. The coffee mugs coffee mugs we'll keep. And also, as I mentioned, like this is sort of a teaser of woo, tie-dye champion sweater. So it's not ultra super soft like the ones that are up now, but this is embroidered, which is pretty nice. It's pretty nice. And the pedantic looks pretty nice too. Uh, they also recently added pint glasses to the store thing. 
Yeah, so these were just test prints and I'm not sure my feelings on them. I was hoping it would be nicer than what it is. So my husband's into brewing beer. We go to like beer shows and festivals and other things and you get glasses. And so we've seen the full gamut of like kind of shitty prints to like the nicer ones that seem like the last. Like we have some from honestly like 20 years ago. Yeah, 20 years ago that are pretty solid still. The design has held up even though we dishwasher it when we have dishwashers. This this it feels like a sticker that got like melted onto the glass it looks nice but just i'm not i'm not sure how well these are gonna last like a pedantic pint come on just writes itself but yeah it's it's it's, it's a sticker and i don't know how i feel about that so we are going to stress test these puppies and if it can survive a couple months of my husband and have it hold up then i might consider rolling them out but otherwise these are a maybe these will be coming soon though. Okay, anyways, that's enough shilling of my merch. For now. So this cube usually has a lobster living in it to hide when it's in frame all of the stuff. So this is usually hiding things, which frequently includes like my pill splitter, uh, lip stuff, camera lens, cover, water, keyboards, which I've got on my lap right now. Ooh, mystery box revealed. Ooh. So this cubby is like, I'm a cognitive psychologist. See, look at my cognitive books. Set design on a budget. And then all the mystery cubes who will continue to be a mystery for the time being. I probably need to move my little guys. We've got Algie, the algorithm dog. Always, always watching. Always creeping on you. We're gonna get ya. Just like the stupid tar videos, which, um... NBC Universal decided was not enough creative interpretation of their work, and so they get all profits from those videos. Jokes on them. Videos not doing as well as I'd hoped. A mind of its own, the cultural history of the penis. Love, love the choice of artwork and everything. Setting out to make intellectual and emotional sense of a man's relationship with his defining organ. Showing some of the pictures in the middle would get this channel demonetized. <laughs> uh, so this is something I want to cover at some point because it is interesting to think about the cultural history of the penis. Okay, so continuing, I guess we have our chaos snake stand in Yoshi, our little amiibo Yoshi, and Pikachu because can't have enough Pikachus, and some swag I picked up from Psychonomics one year. I am very eager for swag. that It did not come with the eyeballs. I added those because it's hilarious, but it's it's a stress, stress, stress brain squeezy. Up next is The Pursuit of Oblivion. This honking beast. Book cover long since lost. Talks about the history of drug use, largely in the West and the cultural attempts to control it or where it's allowed, where it's not. I think I've mentioned at some point on this channel, maybe multiple points, that where I went to undergrad, we had three psych professors. One taught cognitive and also he was a child developmental psychologist that was his specialty so i got like a weird view on cognitive from him the other was the head of the department and my undergrad advisor as much as undergrad advisors really do uh, he was a psychophysicist who also taught abnormal experimental intro like they rotated through who would do experimental and intro and i just happened to have it from him uh, he was probably my favorite professor all time, hands down. Uh, anyway, so the third professor was a fun guy. So we had a rat lab that I worked in, and he did teratological research on rats. Uh, basically gave the mother rats drugs that we we're interested in seeing what the effects were on developing fetuses and stuff. So not the most pleasant research, but important research. Uh, so I worked in the rat lab, and he was like our neuro guy. Uh, so I took Psychobiology of Sex from him, which is where I read that book, and the Drugs and Behavior. What was it called? Psychopharmacology 1. Psychopharmacology 2 was like the legal chemicals that people use to alter brain chemistry. So like the psychoactive, like uh, medicinal, um, what the... My brain is still fried from last week. Words are hard. Um, prescription. Prescription drugs that are used to alter brain chemistry for like depression or schizophrenia and things like that. The way he did his classes is there was the main textbook, like uh, this guy, 
Drugs and Behavior was the main textbook for the Psychopharmacology 1 class. Um, somewhere is the Psychobio textbook he used. And then there was a reading list, and we just had to pick two books off this reading list. And so for Psychobiology of Sex, one of the books I read was The Cultural History of the Penis, because that was a very amusing read. And the other one was less fun. I'll say it was on... Uh, how to say so I don't get flagged. Uh, people who are attracted to minors and sort of exploring that space and the different types of people who are attracted to minors and some who are offending, some who are not offending, what makes a person offend, what makes a person not offend, exploring that. And also like the Romeo Juliet sort of situation um, and how that can continue into somebody's early 20s but still dating high schoolers and how they're sort of different than people who are doing bad things to children. Interesting book, things to think about, but anyway. So this behemoth I read for the psychopharmacology class. And yeah, like it's it's a beast. It's a monster of a book. Um, but it was very, very enlightening for just how fucked up the drug policy in the West is. And I hope to go through this at some point. And we're actually going to flip the order on these because I don't want that next to there. And I put it back in the wrong place. Anyways, Drugs and Behavior. I have talked about this book extensively on this channel, largely in the context of Peterson and what he's doing to his brain. Um, but yeah, just an introduction to behavioral pharmacology with all of the fun classes of drugs that people use recreationally or medicinally. Largely recreationally. Then we have Christoph Cox, The Quest for Consciousness. In grad school, I was part of a reading group where we would pick a book to read and talk about it every week. And for a while, we were just looking at consciousness books from various people. And so we went on the quest for consciousness. And the basic idea here is Koch, who is psychologist. I think he's a neuroscientist, technically. Um, I'll put it on screen when I actually can look it up. He's proposing that we aren't going to find consciousness in the brain. What we can really do is try to find the neural correlates of consciousness and build it up from there. Like, is it an emergent epiphenomenon of how our brain works? Or like, why are we conscious? Why do we have this experience? And it's an incredibly interesting question. And I know he has more recent books than this. And when I stop feeling like I'm drowning with my life, we'll start that. From there, we transition into uh, more textbooky things sort of. So this is the design of everyday things, which is something else I want to get into because it is also interesting to think about how things are designed and how things can be designed wrong. So it is by Donald A. Norman, and I wouldn't be surprised if there was like another updated one. Uh, so this one I read in grad school by my advisor because I took uh, applied cognitive sort of stuff from him. And the engineering psychology and human performance textbook was what we used in that class. Yeah, so it's just talking about how the world is designed and choices that are made and choices that are good choices, like um, doors that exit buildings. It's a good design choice to have handles that are intuitive to use instead of like things that look aesthetically pleasing but are impossible to figure out. Also for like fire safety, if you want people to get out of a building quickly, it's important to have the doors open in a way where people leaving a building on fire can get out and not have to fight it to try to leave. Um, so things like that. Kind of fun because uh, this is like a update because he, when trying to talk about and think about how the internet was going to work, didn't quite think hyperlinks would be as popular as they are. <laughs> uh, if memory serves, I might have that slightly wrong. But yeah, he had to like update it for hyperlinks. Yeah, so this is my Human Factors textbook from grad school. It is by Wickens and Hollins. Wickens is a very cool dude. I can attest to that. Just how do we design things in a way that makes sense for people? And I think I've talked about, yeah, the cognitive revolution and World War II and Max is playing with the window where like people are flying planes into the ground and that's a problem. And then you look at how the planes are designed and it was completely non-intuitive to pilots. So you start listening to pilots, figuring out what way we need to present information in a way that will easily make sense for people. And they stop flying planes to the ground. Revolutionized psychology. <laughs> and 
you know, we're still seeing this today with like design of cars, design of phones. Designers can sometimes, especially if they don't do the testing, and now he's going after the origami, more on that later. Uh, if they don't do enough testing or if they don't have like human factors people on the team, you can get some really dumb choices that just don't make sense and are non-intuitive and people hate the stuff and then they don't use it and they don't buy it and that's a problem. No, that's not a toy. That is not a toy, sir. I guess we're talking about it now. Get off. So different friend than who made the little play button for me. I have a friend who's moving soon. Sad. Um, He folds origami. And we'll just like leave them here. And so they live on my shelf, except Max thinks they're toys. So it's a, it's a struggle between the real cat and the paper cat. Life or death struggle. Anyway, okay. So then we have cognitive books and you're going to learn a lesson on parts of why textbooks are so fucking expensive. Uh, I taught cognitive one semester as an adjunct. One semester. Here is a subset of the cognitive books I was sent by various publishers trying to woo me into using their book for free. So I have, this is, I got rid of a bunch when we moved. There are so many textbooks that they just throw at instructors, like, please use our book, we'll give you things. Where I went to grad school, they would buy people coffee, maybe even take like the person really making the decision out for a nice dinner. Like there's so much money on the back end, just like thrown at professors. So the one I ended up using was the Matlin cognitive or cognition, um, but everybody has like their little focus and their way of explaining things and what, what they really want cognitive to be portrayed as to students. And it's just Matlin is the one I like the most. All of them have proven to be good references at various points though, although they are also 10 years out of date. <laughs> so uh, life of a former adjunct, I guess. These? are probably never going to go out of date. Like I looked at updating my books somewhat recently and yeah, the Sekuler and Blake perception is still going strong and so is the Goldstein. Uh, so Sekuler and Blake was the choice of my undergrad professor. Goldstein was a book of choice for some of the people in my grad program because I took a bunch of perception classes in grad school too. Um, so that's, that's those bad boys. And then we've got my scripts for Beyond Order and a bunch of drawers where I have like pens and medication and other things. And yeah, that might be, that might be it for this side. Okay. And we are on to the other side. I think I have enough cable. All right. So desk side, experimental wall used to be corner, but now it's just a wall. Okay, so I think I'm going to take you on a tour like this way. So we end with the fun fiction stuff and get through the also fun if you're into this sort of thing, but like not like textbooks and whatever. Okay, so we've got just a hodgepodge of things in here, like the Bible, which I think my husband stole from his house when we moved out because why not have the Bible, which has been very, very useful for some of the Peterson stuff. Some like photo albums, notebooks, stuff from my teaching certificate, because yes, I do have one of those, even though it's being utilized in a very creative way here. Um, and a bunch of class notes, either from things I was teaching for or classes I took. I know I have some people in the audience who are just getting into grad school or thinking about going to grad school. And this is, this is a snapshot of your hoarding future. Let me just tell you, this isn't even, I have a couple file organizer things full of notes from grad school just in case I need it or papers I print out with notes that I really don't want to lose just you hoard you hoard and this is after moving to out of country and moving back in country we've gone through a couple purges and I just I can't I can't let some of this go <laughs> anyway so yeah bunch of notes down there in purgatory are things like the pinker books which i need to revisit as well as a textbook from my psychobiology of sex class because it is called male female and i took that class in 2003 2004 so things things have changed not sure how yikes the book is but it is something i want to revisit at some point like i said when i'm not drowning in life anyway we are on a swivel chair and we are swiveling all right so this is Largely bio, but also some stats. So we've got my intro bio textbook, which saw a lot of use. Cell and molecular biology. Oh my god, that class. 
Uh, it was co-taught by two professors. One who taught medical, or um, not medical, taught physio. And another professor whose last name we were not allowed to say. Um, there were a couple Russian professors where I went to school. They were very protective of their last names. Some of them were angry. Like, you you Americans can't see it, right? Don't even try. Call me Oleg. Which, okay. Stats prof. Cool. Snezna also had a last name that she just discouraged us from trying to pronounce. She was Snezna. That was cool. So that was team taught. And oh my God, like her class, her half of the class, like she was great. She was great. She was not my favorite biology professor, but she was definitely up there. Uh, take home tests. Take home tests. We had the weekend to do it. We could spend however much time we wanted. We could use the textbook. We could use online, whatever. However, we got the answers. She didn't care. And there was extra credit. Oh, beautiful. The other professor, <laughs> who I did like, but just, oh my God, his tests were impossible. Impossible. Uh, he had a bunch of pre-med students, so they were like, it was boot camp for them. But for someone like me, who was just trying to pick up a bio minor, oh, so yeah, like I did A, A plus on her half of the class, C on his half of the class, uh, and averaged out, I think, to an A. And this is my physio textbook from undergrad. Yeah, uh, he was, the professor was quite proud that this was a book that was used in a lot of American med schools because, you know, he was saving the students money and getting them familiar with it because they're going to have to go into it eventually. And yeah, that was that was definitely a learning experience. And before I figured out how I need to study for tests. So there were definitely some times where I just wrote in a funny answer diagram, like the Krebs cycle. I didn't think we were going to have to draw it out, and then we did, so I just drew a funny cartoon. <laughs> I didn't get points, but I did make him laugh. Hi. What do you have to say? Uh, yeah? Uh, really? What else? Uh, really? Uh, yeah? But she's like, I can't sit on your lap there. This is bullshit. The last of the biology books from my undergrad experience is ecology, which I mentioned last time. And that was hands down my favorite ecology or biology class in undergrad. I could have probably gone into biology. Like I think it's interesting and fun and stuff. But uh, the funny, sad part is uh, I'm most interested in like, I don't know if you'd call it macrobiology, but like ecology, the whole organism, not how like different cell signaling pathways work or whatever. Don't, don't really care so much about that, but like the whole ecosystem and everything. And it's sad and funny uh, because coworker friend of my husband's son has an ecology degree and has worse employment prospects than cognitive. Like I just, I can't pick a capitalistically viable profession, I guess. And then you're going to see the first of the textbooks that I stole from somebody. Well, is it really stealing if they leave it in the hallway? Yeah, so periodically a professor will do some spring cleaning, get rid of some textbooks, and leave it in the hallway for us poor students to steal. Well, again, I keep saying steal. That's where this bad boy came from. I never use it in class, but I have it. And then this is a sort of, it's a proto textbook from a guy I took a class from. Uh, because it was the textbook wasn't in print yet, so he just printed us off, printed a printed us off a copy of the textbook for us to use. And why he's an amazing dude. Um, but yeah, so human factors y sort of stuff. And yeah, it was, it was a good class. It was not at my school. Like we had to drive to do this class once a week, but it was definitely far more interesting than some of the stuff I was getting locally. Let's say that. Kitty up top. I put an Ikea cube up there as a sort of bait box to see if we can at least get kitty feet in this video, and it seems to be working. Yes. Okay, so then stats books. We have the stats book, which was much more simple than the one I had in undergrad. This was first semester grad stats. This was second semester grad stats. And yeah, first semester was just 
stats again, I guess, in case we missed it in undergrad, get everybody on the same page, which fine, fair. The one I had in undergrad hit the probability normal distribution stuff harder. This one kind of glosses over it because to really get into it, you need to have had calc. And I think I was the only person in psychology department at the time I was there taking this class who had had calc. So I can see why, like, let's just, you need to understand this is a normal distribution and it's continuous and we're moving on. Like, I get it. Calc was not fun. Then I mentioned this beast of a book in the last Peterson video because I had to refer back to it for the multiple regressions because I hate doing multiple regressions. The class was torture. It was largely for the counseling students because over in cognitive, we're much more in the ANOVAs side of thing or T-tests. We keep it very, very simple. But counseling with those data sets that they get handed, <laughs> uh, they need to know how to do this shit and they need to understand how to do this shit, even though it involves stuff that I was seeing in Calc 3. And I didn't realize that until I was looking at some of the pictures for the video trying to explain the different variable thing and like, oh, if they had explained it to me as like stuff from Calc 3 where you're doing like integrals in three dimensions or however many dimensions, I probably would have had a really easy time grasping it. But we couldn't use that analogy and I didn't realize that's what it was. <laughs> Moving on. Uh, so this is psychology stuff in roughly chronological order for where I did psychology. And again, ooh, chaos mug, get your own chaos mug. Yours won't have a little Cleo plushie. Rest in peace, Cleo. You are missed. My little black heart. Uh, and then Izzy from another friend who gives me things sometimes, usually kitty things. Hi. <laughs> yeah. Oh, and also a bat. I like bats. This one, purchasing it helped support some antifungal work being done with bats because there's some fungus thing that's like destroying the bat populations. And anyway, so this is roughly my intro or my undergrad psychology experience, although this was not the book we used. And I just squished another origami cat. Whoops. Uh, so this was another textbook I was thrown many, many copies of when I was adjuncting because I wanted to use Schachter. I didn't like the textbook they were using and I was teaching two sections of it. So I was able to pick my own textbook. Sorry for the students who uh, had to try to sell that book back after I left. Sorry. But I did have copies in the library for people, and you could probably also pirate it at that time. Anyway, uh, this was my experimental research methods book. Uh, psychological research. Izzy's going after the lens cap. Anyway, how to do a science in psychology. Uh, again, taught by my favorite professor. And I like the way he did labs. Because uh, a lot of times, like um, down here somewhere, is like this S and P and cognitive lab stuff, where we hand them an experiment, we already know how it's going to go. It's more of a demonstration, really, and then they do it. And then the last thing they do at the end of the semester is they come up with their own experiment, run it, analyze it, and we help them with the stats. Like that's it. His approach, and again, this benefits from being a much smaller situation. Uh, like my experimental class probably had. I don't know, 10 people in it, uh, <laughs> small class. I don't remember if it was like the first experiment we did, but one of the experiments we did was to test ESP, you know, extra sensory perception. And so he gave us like the problem, design an experiment. And he would fuck off back to his office for like 30 minutes and we would have to sit there as a class and try to come up with an experiment to test ESP. And so we came up with something where like a student was sitting at the front of the class, just staring at the wall. <laughs> And there were trials where like, uh, cats at a notification, they would either be looked at or not looked at. And the person had to indicate if they thought they were being looked at or not, you know, very simple, very whatever. And, you know, it worked. Um, that's also how he did the perception lab, which I really enjoyed. We ended up with some really weird experiments that way. And then we would have to analyze things. And one of the early things we did in that class, which I definitely appreciated, was having to go through the math for an ANOVA by hand. It was a simple ANOVA, so an analysis of variance where you're comparing a couple variables, uh, but going through it by hand so that we would understand what math the computer software is doing for us uh, definitely helped make some things more clear. And, you know, that's not something I've ever had to do elsewhere. This other guy doing psychology experiments, I think was what was used at my grad school and there was a copy laying around, so I just grabbed it. APA 
publication manual, which is several copies or versions out of date, I'm sure. But, you know, it's sometimes handy to have a printed version, even though things like the, I don't know, the OWL, like Purdue has a pretty good resource for different format stuff. Psychology Research Handbook. I don't know why I have this, but I have it. Nice dressing. Social Psychology. This is a copy I got out of the free bin in the library, <laughs> but it was like an edition old when I took social psych from the child development guy. Educational and psychological measurement and evaluation. So this was basically psychological testing. The textbook there where we talked about all sorts of tests with my favorite professor, but it was probably the driest course I took from him because it was basically like, here's how things like the ACT, the GRE, ASVAB, all of these different tests, how they're designed, different ways that you can score tests, which is where I learned about how my chemistry professor scored his exams, where it was possible to get a negative score, different considerations when designing tests, which was definitely helpful for the teaching certificate stuff later. I'll definitely say that. There's generally a assumption, heuristic or whatever, that cognitive psychologists can write the more difficult tests because we can if we're paying attention to things. Like uh, there's different traits that can sometimes happen for correct or incorrect answers where you get like the most specific answer is probably the correct one. Uh, the longest answer, odds are, if you aren't sure, it might be the correct one. You know, all sorts of things that you can do to guess. I wrote tests in such a way that that wasn't going to work. Like I would alphabetize the stems so like the order wouldn't necessarily be correct uh, or like it wasn't always necessarily going to be C. I would write the test in such a way that uh, if you were guessing C, you would get a 25%. <laughs> what else did I do? Yeah, I would try to keep the stem lengths equivalent as much as I could so that wouldn't be a giveaway. You know, I'd also throw in fun answers every once in a while when I couldn't think of something, you know, just a gimme, like, this is obviously not it. And then even then I'd have people answering that sometimes. So great. Oh no, this is actually my psychological testing book. Uh, not this one. Another mystery book that I probably picked up from somebody's office. <laughs> cool. And then we get the developmental books. So child and adult development taken from a developmental psychologist. These were definitely interesting and the child development was particularly fun because he had some young kids and so would bring them in and do demonstrations with them of like object permanence with the younger one and stuff. And we'll just move this kitty over because there's another one. Yeah. Development across a lifespan from womb to tomb. Good times. And then tucked back here, we have my abnormal psychology book, which again was taught by my favorite professor. I think I've talked more at length about this stuff in other videos, so I won't go into the full blah, blah, blah here for that. But, you know, it's definitely interesting to think about like the cultural norms and how much those influence what is considered a psychological disorder or not. And we're in the middle of one of those massive shifts right now, which some people are too blind to history to realize a shift is even happening. Uh, to not be vague about this, uh, basically trans people, non-binary people, where, you know, yeah, some part of some people's experience is sort of medicalized because to get the treatment, it's a whole process with the gender dysphoria for diagnosis and treatment. And some segment of the population, the Petersons of the world, if you will, fighting against that, that it's not even a valid identity to have, even though we saw this with gay and lesbian people, like not in my lifetime, but in his lifetime, certainly, where just it's a shift and it's happening and you can either be with the progress and humanizing people and not demonizing or othering them for part of their identity, or you can be doing that and being a dick about it all over Twitter and... <sighs> Anyways, preaching to the choir, I'm sure, on this channel. Okay, so we're going to scoot. We're going to scoot while I'm scooting. I will mention that these are basically my scripts for the 12 Rules series, and I did a very intentional thing where the 12 Rules binders are in black. The Beyond Order blinders binders are in white because, woo, we're all about themes. Uh, and also, just check it for Beyond Order because <laughs> I picked up a habit of my husband's in not using desk jackets. Desk jackets? Dust jackets. Okie doke. So now we're leaving or we're starting the transition into out of my academic stuff. Uh, so one of 
one of two humanities classes I had to take in undergrad because it was a STEM school. My God, uh, it was my art history book. Uh, that professor, I definitely appreciated her approach um, because there's the big school that was like an hour and a half away or whatever. And I know I had some friends who took art history there and it was basically just memorizing dates for different movements or pieces and having to be tested on that. Her approach was more looking at the cultural context for pieces that produced pieces or how they were responses to cultural movements and things. And so we didn't have to just memorize a bunch of pieces and stuff. It was more know the different time periods and be able to talk about art that was coming from those periods and what it said about those periods or commented on and things like that. So I definitely, definitely appreciated her for that. The other humanities course I took uh, yeah, we will talk about it in a bit because the book is over there. Introduction to the History of Psychology. Of course, I never took an undergrad, <laughs> but I TA'd for in grad. Multiple times. Cool professor. It was very, like, so some professors, like the perception professor, not the one I had the horrible experience with that I talked about in TAR, a different one who was on my dissertation committee. She wanted me to come once a week every week. To class. Like the class was twice weekly and I had to come every week. I hated it. The room was too warm. I got tired. Grumpy, grump, grump. I figured it would be a bad look for the grad student to sleep during class, so it was really, really a struggle for me. History of psychology. Uh, he had me come once a week the first semester because I had never taken history before, which is a very fair, very fair thing to ask of me. But then after that, just had to periodically make an appearance and then show up for the test and help grade brilliant. And then more copies of Sensation and Perception. <laughs> Yay! You could not, like, we were told, this is fun, we were told, like, we were given a copy every semester that we taught or that we did the lab for this. And we were told, these are instructor copies, do not sell them. The first time somebody came around our basement looking to buy books, I did the good thing and I said no. I've been told I'm not to sell these, so I'm not going to sell these. The second time, much later into my academic process in grad school, and after a point where I'd kind of stopped caring, it's like, yeah, how much? 20? Sweet. I'm going to go have lunch. Enjoy my instructor copy of this book, which I was given for no reason, even though I already have like three copies and there's Max. Um, yeah. So again, why books, part of why books are so damn expensive. Is a dragon in the way? Ugh. There. Now we got Max Feeds. Perfect. So talking about academic hoarding, this is the world of perception. Uh, how old are you? This is something I rescued from my favorite professor's office. This is the 1966 edition. Woo. Uh, yeah. So at some point, you know, schools be making new buildings all the time and psychology was being moved into a different building and it was time to clean out his office which he had not done possibly ever he got some of the undergrads to volunteer basically me and my husband uh, to help pack up his office because at that point he had so it was like right before i started undergrad he had a stroke that ended up sort of sort of paralyzing half of his body like he lost proprioception on half of his body so his coordination wasn't so good um so he's having undergrads, free labor. It was volunteered. I was fine with it. Uh, help him pack up his office and clear things out. And so he was getting rid of books. And I was like, no, this is, this is an important history. I am taking that. Uh, although it was funny getting through the stack of paper and like, oh, be careful. There's probably some live rat traps in there still. And there were, there were mouse traps, but they were old enough that they were like fused open. I don't think that'll support your weight, bud. And he's coming. Why do you hate my bat so much? I got it on camera finally. I don't. He has it out for this bat. I don't get it. And then here is my James Gibson Ecological Approach to Visual Perception book, which, funny story on how I got it. So Peterson references Gibson when he wants to talk about perception. And I ha was familiar with the book. I'd read it in grad school, but I didn't have a copy of it. And I was complaining about getting a copy being like expensive and whatever. Uh, so it was just sort of leaving it at that. So then I get 
a PayPal message for $75, which was basically the cost of the book, from somebody who very strongly disagrees with me about Peterson. They watch my videos and they appreciate the effort that I'm putting into them. So here's money to buy that stupid book. Bye. Never watching your videos again. So that's why I have a Gibson book. Okay, and then we have Crashing Through, a also No Dust Jacket. Woo, look at that book art. Uh, Crashing Through by Robert Curson about a guy who, as a kid, lost his vision and then was able to get it reback. Re -back. He was able to get it restored because he, for some reason, he was like playing around in his mom's like garage or something and got acid and so it just destroyed his corneas um so as an adult he was able to get a transplant of corneas and like he did downhill skiing blind like he did all this crazy stuff blind then his experiences regaining his sight what that was like and definitely illustrative of um critical periods in visual development and stuff so it's very interesting hearing about his experiences um probably going to talk about the paper that he was on where they tested his vision for things because that's pretty interesting and also the book because his story is pretty interesting too. This we read in the grad perception class so that was that was cool. And then we got Csikszentmihalyi Flow, another book I want to talk about um, because yeah it's pretty interesting. The psychology of optimal experience and as I mentioned in recent-ish Beyond Order book um, has a better life advice sort of thing for how to construct meaning out of things than Peterson, which rip. Um, also, this is a Russian-ish last name that I can pronounce because another grad student met the author and like went to lunch with him or something and got the mnemonic for how to pronounce it. Chick sent me highly. So, yay. Okay, so now we're starting to get out of the more academic -y stuff. Um, so, A Brief History of Vice by Robert Evans, who does fun stuff on Twitter on the regular, um, got exposed to him through Cracked and then that Cracked. And uh, anyways, this is an interesting book on how bad behavior built civilization. So that's, that's fun filling things out because we only have so much bookshelf space. Uh, this is one of my dad's books from when he went to college. Uh, it's an Edgar Allan Poe, just stuff he wrote. Um, my dad was sort of an English major. Like he got a uh, associates in computer stuff, but he did a bunch of English stuff because I think that's really where his passion was. But English doesn't pay bills. Never has, never will. And then we've got The Hobbit because Pearson has been talking about Lord of the Ringsy stuff. And I gave my mom my copy of the Lord of the Rings, but I kept The Hobbit. And then we need we need to re-scooch. Re-scooch. Okay, so then we have another kitty, another little kitty friend, and my happy little crow. Like, Halloween decorations, man. You can take somebody sort of out of the goth scene, but you can't take the goth out of the person. And my bird, little raven, which Max will also try to knock off the shelf on the regular. And a little Pusheen chaos monster snake. Rawr. So then we have the Kipling Jungle Book, little itty bitty thing there, um, because, you know, like it, English was my dad's thing and we read a bunch when I was a kid and so Jungle Book has a special little place in my heart even though it's got some yikes. He does have some yikes in his writing. Uh, then this huge fuck off guy is our copy of Girdle Escher Bach, um, an eternal golden braid. I've tried reading it. I've gotten like that far into this beast, my husband did an independent study with my favorite professor uh, because he, I guess I'll skip ahead. The other humanities course I took was philosophy of science from my favorite professor. And our textbook was an introduction to the philosophy of science by Carnap. Um, so my husband really enjoyed that class a lot. And so did an independent study where like, let's talk philosophy more. And this was his textbook and he would meet with the professor like once a week and talk about what he'd read and talk philosophy and just have a grand old time. And then we've got the my copy of the Tao Te Ching, which I actually bought because of one of the books down here, or at least one of the authors down here. Um, so when Peterson starts talking about it, I can just refer to it and be like, hmm, no, 
because it's always mm, no with him. And then we got Sun Tzu, The Art of War, which was good bathroom reading for a while. <laughs> Can't always be conditioner balls, you know? Sometimes you gotta mix it up, read a book. In the days before phones. Copy of Karl Marx's collection of writings that we picked up at some point with just so much writing in it. So could throw that at Peterson at some point if I ever want to get in a raccoon debate with him. And then this is over here because I don't know what to do with it. I don't even really remember much about it other than it being torture. So this is Rimbaud's A Season in Hell and the Drunken Boat. This was required reading for my art history class. And like, I really enjoyed the class. And when we got into that period of French art, she had us read this and it was pretty impenetrable for me. So that's, that's why I could still live over here and not over there. And then this is Damasio's The Feeling of What Happens, his approach to the problem of consciousness. And it has some interesting stories of doing clinical work from with people with disconnects in their consciousness. Like somebody with, um, I forget what the actual, like the other term is, but petite mal seizures. So they're not like violently seizing, but it's more of a quiet seizure where just sort of consciousness clicks off for a bit. They wander off and then come to in a different room and like, okay, I guess I had another seizure. Great. And then sitting next to my philosophy book is Flatland, a romance of many dimensions, because we talked about Flatland in the philosophy course, because it's interesting. It's a story about reality, kind of, where we live in like a four-dimensional space, or however you want to define it. And to somebody who is interacting with that from a 3D space, you know, it's different. And then what the 3D space looks like to somebody in two dimensions and what the two dimension space looks like to somebody in one dimension. I'm not doing it justice. It's a short little read. Interesting read. Anyway. And then we got this beast, which was my husband's and not so much mine. But I probably should try to read it at some point. Karl Popper, The Logic of Scientific Discovery. Because there is a lot of philosophy in how we do science and it's important to think about how do we know what we know? Hmm. And then a bunch of little books I picked up for sale on the bookstore. Uh, sort of philosophy stuff or just fun illusions and whatever. Escher. And then this, I can't sleep. It's actually a journal that I got given by one of my students the first year I adjuncted uh, because we talked about insomnia at some point. And when we did the psych disorder section, I basically started with like a little bit of the history a little bit on like anxiety, mood disorders, and then close out that day's class with, hey, let's try to normalize and destigmatize. Um, I have bipolar and generalized anxiety disorder. Ask me anything. And so my insomnia came up, even though I think my insomnia is more a product of being a hardcore night owl. Like I got up at 7 p.m. today because last week was a mess and I couldn't sleep. But for the most part, if I'm able to keep my own hours, I have a pretty regular sleep schedule. It's just I'm going to bed when the sun's coming up. Anyway, so that's just a little journal that you're supposed to work on when you can't sleep. And that's cute. And then finally in this cubby, we've got Beowulf, which of course Peterson has also referenced. So it's nice that I have a copy from, God, ages ago. So when I was a kid, I read Crichton. And what was the book? Eaters of the Damned? I think that got turned into the 13th Warrior movie, found out that it was basically Beowulf. So then it's like, oh, I should read Beowulf. And so I did because I was that kid. And you're going to see how much of that kid I was when we get down there. Scoochie boochie. We're just going to stand because I have legs and I can stand. And again, I mentioned Halloween. Halloween. <laughs> Love that time of year. Anyway, so gift from the people who made me the plaque. The Adventures of Princess and Mr. Wiffle. A uh, signed copy. Um, <laughs> good book. Dark book. Good book. Um, it's sort of as kid-friendly as uh, Go the Fuck to Sleep, if that helps. And then another of my dad's books from college, the Norton Anthology of English Literature, just has a bunch, bunch of stuff in it. World mythology stuff, like Dictionary of World Myth, Bullfinch's Complete Mythology, uh, The Odyssey, little itty-bitty copy, and I am so out of frame. Hi! Now we're into fiction I enjoy. Um, so we have Helsing, the first one. Uh, the others I 
read through other means because finding copies when I was in undergrad was difficult. Uh, I was able to find this one, but not the other ones. So I found them through other means. And at the point of doing that, the series wasn't finished yet. It's now finished. And oh my god, again, the, the OVA. Good stuff, if you like that stuff. My copy of Watchmen, which is a good graphic novel. And at some point, one of the box it was in kind of got wet, so it got a little crunchy up top. That's okay. We still love it. And anybody want to take bets before how long Peterson starts using Rorschach as his little go-to posty thing on Twitter? Because right now he's moved on to the Joker instead of just like scary clowns. It's the Joker or people cosplaying as the Joker. He's particularly fond of Joaquin Phoenix. One of his tweets, he said something about something being a joke and it's like, okay, he's clearly on the path to using Rorschach instead. I'm missing the point entirely. So then we hit the cyberpunk start with Neuromancer by William Gibson, who is a different Gibson than that Gibson. Um, Neuromancer, I have electronic copies of the sequels, and I'm trying to make this as interesting as I can. <laughs> so I'll do some contortion. Um, so Neuromancer, which is sort of like, I don't know if it's exactly the birth of cyberpunk as a genre, but it's pretty damn early. Um, I saw in an interview at some point, he said that he was working on that and saw Blade Runner and was like, oh, fuck. You know, his idea is basically there in a movie form, but slightly different. And then Count Zero. Okay, so then I got the third one. My copy, my second copy of Dune. I don't know what happened to my first copy. It might still be at my mom's house. It might not be. But my copy of the first Dune book. And then I've got the sequels electronically because sometimes you don't want a huge ass book. Then we've got... Aldous Huxley, Brave New World, another book that Peterson seriously misses the point on. It's 1984 here? I have 1984 somewhere. 1984 might be in my mom's house. So basically, um, this is a subset of my fiction books because when we had to basically move out of the country for my husband's postdoc, uh, I'll just, yeah, this isn't awkward. Uh, when we moved out of the country for my husband's postdoc, we basically took the essentials, which for me included some of these books. And the rest went into storage either at my mom's house or his parents' house. So I have a lot of books there still because we haven't found the time to try to get them out to where we are living now. And also we keep having to move and it's so fucking dumb. Okay. Anyway, Brave New World. So 1984, I might be living with my mom. Then we got Vonnegut, Slaughterhouse 5. When you hear me going, so it goes, I am quoting the little birdie. Oh, to tweet. And then something that's come up periodically is my copy of Dante's Inferno. It's the only part of the Divine Trilogy that I've read, so I haven't read um, Paradiso or the other one. <laughs> um, before moving down, because, you know, it's pretty apparent, like we've got this little bear in frame. I've got a stuffed animal net up there. Actually, let's do it this way, sort of. Let's not. Actually, let's not. Let's not break the camera. Finally got these guys out of storage after many, many years, so some of them are very squished. Um, but stuffed animals that have moved with me because as a kid, I had several hundred stuffed animals. Like, I was kind of, kind of, it was a problem. So it's part of why I don't have a P.O. box, because I have a hard time getting rid of things. I'll show you this guy, because this guy's special. I mean, they're all special in their own way. But this is Dr. Meow Kitty Stripes. <laughs> basically because I had to defend remotely because I couldn't afford to fly back to defend in person or even get to walk which I'm still upset about for my PhD I defended my dissertation remotely and after I got news that I passed we went out had a nice dinner at a place that burned down since then and then I was hoping to get a dinosaur <laughs> they didn't have any at the Build-A-Bear that was there or like the equivalent, whatever the local thing was called, but basically like a Build-A-Bear with this little tiger. So this is this is my Dr. Meow Kitty Stripes who is commemorating me getting a PhD. <laughs> yeah. You're welcome to place your guesses for what this guy, for what my Chaos Dragon commemorates. If anybody gets it, I will be shocked. Moving down, why I want to talk about it. So I had a little guy from World of Warcraft. I had the little pet, little pet wedge of Higgy. I'm blanking on what they're named. 
I'll put this here and I'm probably dying. You guys are probably dying that I can't remember it even though I played WoW for God knows how many hours. A little moose. Got a little moose. Cause mooses are fun when they're not trying to run you over or kill you in your car. I think I've mentioned in the past that I have been a Pokemon gym leader for, or I was a Pokemon gym leader for a couple years. And then the kids started getting into magic, so I got into magic. And then I really got into magic. Like, I have far too much money invested in cards, which are in a different room. Um, but for a bit, I was into the lore, too. This is part of the Ice Age cycle. And then, like, just general folklore or stories in magic. So I have some of those. I don't know. I guess the other ones are at my mom's house. But I had, like, the Onslaught trilogy... Uh, the one before that, whatever that trilogy was called. Um, so, did some fluff reading. Like, I could read one of those a night. Mm -hmm. And then Gary Larson, a book from The Kitty Friend. I could pee on this and other poems by cats. Good book. And then she also <laughs> sent me Cats and Hats when I got into knitting. So this is Cats and Hats. And basically, everybody who had cats was getting hats that year for Christmas from me. <laughs> Um, and then we've got A Day in the Life of Marlon Bundo, which would be a kid-friendly book. Then we've got Good Omens. I know a bunch of you are like, yay! Um, so yeah, Good Omens. Here's, here's a deep cut for some of you. So, no! Dr. Kitty. So this book is Nightwatch. I'm not even going to try to pronounce the author's name because it's, it's Russian. It's translated from Russian. Um, move, move, focus, focus, there we go, Night Watch. I think I saw the movie first and then picked up the book while I was at APS one year at a really nice bookstore in DC, APS being the American Psychological Society annual meeting. It was at DC, there was this 24 hour bookstore coffee shop thing that we went to and they had this, I was like, score, something to read on the plane when we go back home. And yeah, it's an interesting book like there's a war between the light and the dark sides but there has to be a balance but like the leaders of the two sides are always trying to fuck each other over um interesting stuff and then we have a subset of my philip k dick books a subset like i have all of them except for his last couple books like i even have the the short story collections and stuff so he was is one of my favorite sci-fi authors so many science fiction movies you can point to and like, oh yeah, that was a Philip K. Dick story, at least originally, like Blade Runner was not one of these books. Um, Do Androids Dream of Electric Sheep? And the full story goes into much more than just focusing on the one angle that Blade Runner does. And interesting questions about like religion, for one, religion in an electronic age, uh, what humanity does sort of after the death of the planet. Uh, things like that. Uh, then we've got an Irving Welsh, The Acid House, which is just this trippy ass book. Um, Irving Welsh wrote Train Spotting, or the stories that sort of got turned into the movie Train Spotting, and this is something else by him, which just interesting writing style. Like you have to read it in Scottish, basically. Like if you can't get the accent in your head, you're not going to be able to figure out what's being said. Um, but trippy, trippy stuff. Ken Kesey's One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest, which, you know, I think really should be required reading for a lot of psychologists because it was definitely a period of time that we need to not forget for how mental health can be treated and what can happen in situations where power is abused. Oh, just a random comic. So I love the Pearls Before Swine comic strip. I think it's so funny. Um, so this is one book that moved with us a couple times. Oh, hey, I guess I should have looked at this book, bottom shelf. Okay, so we are in the last final fiction cube. We are on the ground and I don't want to mess up the tripod too much. So we're just, we're going to be bringing stuff up. So I've got one book from the Torment cycle and then two books from the Onslaught cycle because I have a good complete collection here. <laughs> um, we have Halo, the Fall of Reach. So before the Reach video game happened, there was this. Because we did many a Halo Land party, and so it's an interesting story. Um, at least it was. <laughs> I, don't, I haven't played five yet because I'm waiting for the multiplayer to happen, like the multiplayer campaign. 
story campaign because I don't like playing them by myself. Like, I'm fine with the aliens and stuff, but as soon as the flood is in the picture, like, I hate the game. Hate it. Hate it. Let's go back to the aliens. So then we get to what type of co kid I was in middle school. Yeah, you can't see any of them. So we're just going to have to pull one up as an illustration. So this is a very well-loved copy of Anne Rice interview with the vampire. Uh, I was finally able to talk my mom into getting this for me in seventh grade, the summer after seventh grade, because uh, I wanted to see the movie because I had Brad Pitt. Hello. And that was a no-go. No-go. Absolutely not. There's stuff in there you're not allowed to see, young lady. I push, I push, I push. And finally, I guess she relented and the book was okay, even though the book is a million times more like disturbing than the movie was. And so, mom, if you're watching this, explain why book okay, but movie not. Although it's funny, um, at some point before NBC played their like edited down copy or blurred out copy of it, I finally like pestered her enough to let me see it. <laughs> and she fast forwarded through two parts of it. One part was with, um, Armand on stage with the chick who like ends up getting naked because nudity oh my god that's bad and then also the scene with earlier with the sex workers who get killed that scene was entirely fast forwarded through and her doing like the don't look you're not looking you're not looking oh this will corrupt you all the violence totally fine I saw Die Hard 3 in the theaters on the condition that I not repeat any of the language Die Hard 3, American. Uh, so then we have basically the Anne Rice Vampire series from Interview with Vampire up through like Blood and Gold and Pandora. I don't have the more, more recent stuff. Like I don't have sort of the end of the series because I was kind of happy with where it was. And yeah, I just haven't necessarily felt inspired to pick it up again. But I got sort of into some of her other stuff like The Mummy it was kind of interesting. And then the last little book here that I think is kind of funny to wrap up with, especially with the little guy sitting here. I guess I can put him back maybe. Um, so this is Warcraft War of the Ancients Archive. Uh, got this at another APS conference in San Francisco, funnily enough. Basically, like, I need something to read on the plane and pick that up from a bookstore while I was there sick as a dog at that conference so spent most of it in the hotel room oh well that's how these things go sometimes so yeah those are my books that are here that are not living in a different state with my palm <laughs> someday i'll get those and then have nowhere to put them those be my books please do not make fun of me for how to out of date some of the textbooks are because that's how these things go and especially with the ability to get copies online anymore. You know what I'm saying, especially with the cost, especially since they're not just being thrown at me. And anyways, that was the bookshelf tour. If you have any questions, do let me know. And I'll probably, I don't know if I should put this at the beginning. The experiment is live that I mentioned, the McHugh money choice questionnaire. It is live. I will probably leave it open another couple weeks, so you have a bit of time to take it. Uh, but that will probably be the video after the another Peterson video after this. So it'll be like a month and yeah. Anyways, so pedantic citation needed. And again, if you are all the way here at the end and you are supporting me in some way, even just watching the video, it's a huge help, especially a weird video like this. It's probably not going to get the same traffic as the other ones. Um, but it's doubly so if you are somebody who has thrown money at me, thank you very much very much for supporting the channel. You make all of this possible. You really do. I can't understate it enough and I'm awkward at this sort of shit. So we're just going to leave it here. Um, until next time. Bye. <laughs>